for the short delay here. Um, so for those of you who were here last time, I gave you information on the party. The party is going to be downstairs, and everybody is, uh, it starts at 9 o'clock. You do need your badge to get in, and uh, you should come uh, from this side over here to get in. And the party is going to be in this area um, after the con's over. Just dress like that. If you have one of those, go ahead and suit up. All right, uh, we're going to go ahead and turn the time over to uh, Three Alarm, and uh, he's going to go ahead and with his presentation. Okay, so why are you all intently staring at some weird dude in a fire proximity suit about to deliver a talk entitled, This Message Will Self-Destruct in 10 Seconds, Avoiding Bilateral Nucleation? Well, the short answer is the shmoo works in mysterious ways. The long answer to this question is a little complex and indirectly stretches back several years. However, more immediately, the prospect of me speaking here was first broached at the October DC 2600 meeting, which, by the way, I will shamelessly plug. I was waxing poetic about the finer points of N-acetylated amino acid derivatives, as I often do when the subject of getting tickets for ShmooCon this year comes up. Uh, let's change slides. Yeah, this is a little hack together, by the way. <laughs> As you might have noticed, uh, accomplishing this is becoming a nearly impossible feat of musical chairs given the relative popularity of the conference compared to the diminutive capacity of this particular subterranean venue. Apparently, seeing the uh, audience here today, that's not so much of an issue for my talk. <laughs> Uh, anyways, so being the inventive hacker I am, I quickly appraised the situation and the clear strategy of attempting to procure a coveted speaker spot rapidly emerged. Of course, securing a speaker spot for the rigorous proceedings such as these is a nearly superhuman feat in and of itself, requiring demonstration of not only adept skills in the chosen security-related subject matter, but also indirect social engineering of the Call for Papers committee. After all, there only ended up being a 15.77% acceptance rate this year, so somehow my brand of crazy was crafty enough to get on stage here. Uh, let's see again. There we go. <laughs> so uh, I did a bit to doubt my decision this morning at about 5 a.m. when I uh, checked Schmookon's Twitter feed and their last tweet was about parking woes and then the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority's website stating that the Metro Red Line was experiencing severe delays due to their perpetually inadequate attempts at upgrading ancient rail infrastructure, which always seemed to be coincident with Schmookon. If I were mystically minded, I might think this was some karma retribution for gaming the system to get a ticket. I was almost starting to doubt my good fortune and formulating a snarky tweet in my mind about the relative merits of booking the Dulles Expo Center next year when uh, Schmookon comes around again. But the Schmoo works in mysterious ways, and I instead decided to tweet about my first world problems and narcissistically like said tweet. <laughs> so, the uh, call for papers. Uh, it clearly stated no rehashes, but rules are made to be broken as long as they are broken in novel and innovative ways. That's how the EFF gets cases, after all. But CFP submissions can be analogous to certiorari petitions in terms of their high likelihood for futility. So how did this particular Hail Mary make it past the vetting process? Uh, this is where knowing your target well comes in. My secret weapon was stating, quote, Bruce Potter has a hard-on for anti-forensics. Uh, Three-alarm lamp scooter can spell Schmookon properly and loves the smell of ethanol benzene monomers in the morning. Uh, as to why my talk was a good fit for Schmookon, against six to one odds, I did get accepted, and I'm trying to make this the most damn entertaining rehash possible. So how exactly did data destruction turn into a rehash, an apparently perpetual fetish of Bruce's? So, change slides again. <laughs> uh... Well, some of you may remember, Bruce had a very entertaining presentation with Deviant OM and Shane Lawson at DEF CON 19 entitled, And That's How I Lost an Eye, Exploring Emergency Data Destruction, where they went over various misadventurous methods for rapidly disposing of data on hard drives in the hypothetical event of rapid invasion of a data center by a hostile actor. Gonna love this next slide. Uh, there we go. <laughs> I think that's all working. Uh, so the basic idea here is you have some variety of extremely valuable data sitting around in your data center, say 10,000 bitcoins, plans for a Tellerulam device, a video of your CEO engaged in coitus with a prostitute, or a rare Pepe collection, as is illustrated here. Uh, basically something that would best be kept uh, out of the hands of enemy actors and it would be catastrophic and a resume generating event at best if it ended up for sale on the deep web to several of the highest bidders. 
So then the rapid invasion by a hostile actor happens. Now, appraising which hostile actor might be going after your data is obviously uh, pretty imperative here. Uh, the hostile actor on the left is more likely to be on the prowl for copper and just got out of county lockup for boosting boxer briefs at the local Walmart. Uh, now, if we're talking about a heavily armed force of uh, forensically trained ninja operators with support of a tremendous organization bordering on technological omnipotence possessing technologies not yet published in academic literature and that will not be for decades, uh, along with no regard for the asinine financial burden of their operations, uh, then that's a little harder. I think the clones of Krieger, the mad scientist character from Archer, do a pretty good job of illustrating an actor's mindset. Uh, you know, could be a three-letter agency, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, of course, you might say, why not just encrypt your data in the first place? Uh, well, of course you should, but unless you use a one-time pad generated by counting clicks from a Geiger counter in a lead-lined bunker two kilometers underneath Nevada, there is some chance that this nearly omnipotent actor has already compromised the encryption algorithm you're using. Uh, if you don't think this is the case, you probably don't have your foil hat on tight enough. I definitely got my foil hat on tight enough, right? It's a laugh line, people. There we go! Come on, it's Shmoocon! Live it up! All right, that's a little better. People are seeming dead here. <laughs> Anyways... Uh, probably don't have your foil hat on tight enough if you think that crypto is enough. Of course, even if you're using strong encryption, there's always the issue of rubber hose cryptanalysis. A uh, strong actor could quite simply use a $5 wrench to beat the encryption key out of you, as is illustrated in this XKCD. But if your foil hat happens to be on extremely tight, you might even consider the wacky possibility that a well-resourced entity has already spent billions of dollars inserting mind control chips into the world's top cryptographers, if not replacing them outright with malevolent, malevolent clones, or more likely simply buying them all off with ludicrous quantities of hookers and blow. Thus, we must assume the physical annihilation of sensitive data is a mission-critical imperative here. So... The original challenge, as put forth by Bruce Shane and Deviant, uh, came up with the following parameters. Uh, you have to assume that you have a 1U rack mount server. You have 1U above and below the server to put whatever you want, you know, fire retardant or uh, touch on Zaz did shaving cream a bit. <laughs> uh, must not set off any fire suppression or smoke sensors, must not set off seismic sensors, must not harm other systems in the rack, and must not harm nearby meat sacks, aka humans. Uh, 60 seconds to complete. Uh, of course, there are a lot of supposed commercial solutions out there. However, none of them come in a 3U form factor and can operate on a hard drive in situ. Despite how scary these gigantic shredding machines look, their anti-forensic efficacy against a foe equipped with scanning electron microscopy remains dubious at best. Degaussers certainly work, but they can't operate very well in situ either, and they certainly don't fit in a 3U rack mount server. A lot of the lower-end models that inflict less physical damage uh, on the drive are even more likely to leave behind forensically useful remnant data to any well-resourced -re entities picking through your trash. Uh, and by those, I'm usually talking about the things that fold a hard drive up like a little hard drive taco. You know, it's like a punch. Uh, anyways, so uh, it turns out that there are a couple different acronyms for DIE that are uh, anagrams of acronyms, <laughs> IDE and IED. And uh, Deviant Olam touched on this a lot in uh, his particular uh, part of the DEF CON 19 presentation, and that's how I lost an eye. I'll skip most of the gory details, but essentially he had to do a lot of self-censorship uh, due to Title 18 United States Code Section 842P2B and concluded that the best method would be shooting a large amount of tannerite with a high-powered rifle affixed to the server rack, which of course led to the hilarious quote, we've all moved away from IDE hard drives in the past, we do not want to transition to IED hard drives. Well, that's exactly where Zaz went last summer, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So one of the other things that was originally tried uh, by Shane, mostly, and Bruce also, uh, were chemical attacks on hard drive platters, and that ultimately ended up being pretty much uh, ineffective. It did bubkis. 
Uh, and they submerged them in various acid mixtures that I can only assume included such old-timey alchemy favorites as Aqua Regia and Aqua Fortis, uh, perhaps even with a little helping of Piranha Solution. The issue with this strategy, as Bruce so eloquently put it, is that, quote, Cobalt is about as reactive as a dead amputee. <laughs> Physical destruction was similarly lackluster, involving attempts to breach the driver with hole saws, spade bits, abrasive wheels, and leading to another classic Bruce quote, it's really hard to buy stuff at Home Depot that will make a hard drive go away. Eh, more on that a little later in my talk. Check the garden section. <laughs> That's basically what I gotta say. Uh, perhaps the best success of the talk came with the improvised electrolytic deplating of a ceramic platter using drain cleaner as an electrolyte and some multimeter probes. However, this still didn't prove to be an overly practical solution. Got some really dry humor in here. Get it? Solution, electrolyte, deplating. Eh? Ha ha. Yeah, it takes a chemistry nerd to get some of these. Anyways, so this is the point where things kind of go meta-meta. We've uh, now achieved level 2 schmooception because I'm talking about Zaz's talk about a DEFCON 19 talk given by his people in Schmoo Group. <laughs> uh, so last summer Zaz decided to take a crack at the challenge and present his results at DEFCON 23 as, and that's how I lost my other eye. He definitely strayed outside some of the original challenge parameters in the process using all manner of inventive destruction from plasma cutters and oxygen injection to ballistically actuated nail guns with some degree of success but no clear victories. However, he certainly outdid Deviant Lamb in the incendiary department. He went so far as to get federal and state high explosives manufacturing licensure and take up temporary residence at a local bomb disposal range shooting high-speed video of hard drive snuff porn. I highly recommend you watch his presentation. It's extremely entertaining. Interestingly, despite using enough of what I surmise to be Composition A5 to result in not only bilateral nucleation for nearby meat sacks, but likely multiple traumatic amputations, he still failed to totally obliterate hard drive platters. Uh, but the most successful thing that he did uh, end up coming up with was a uh, shape charge using the Monroe effect. Uh, it was a conical cutout lined by copper, which directs a superheated jet of said molten metal at supersonic velocity in a single direction. Of course, the jet also penetrated over a foot of earth underneath the drive, so its suitability for use in data centers, even disregarding legal and regulatory issues, is highly dubious at best. Of course, he also touched on thermites and thermates to some degree, but other than mentioning his omission of the counterintuitive sounding plaster, yeah, I said that right, plaster, the stuff that's in drywall, don't have too much to say about that. <laughs> I'll get to that later. Uh, Zaz was actually speaking at the DEF CON 101 track and started out by recommending you simply disassemble the hard drives and manually mutilate the platters with sandpaper before dispersing their remains to thwart forensic efforts of a well-determined and funded adversary as being the most practical approach. Now, this might sound pretty disheartening to hard drive anti-forensic enthusiasts. Uh, if so many smart people keep attacking the same problem and only coming up with half-baked solutions, maybe we're looking at one of those P equals NP type of situations here. Uh, so, uh, where does that leave us other than very rehashed? At this point, you might be thinking we're flogging an equine in rigor mortis here. It's beating a dead horse for all you non-biologists. Come on. Hey, schmook on. <laughs> Jesus, have to pay you people to laugh. <laughs> Anyways, uh, perhaps we've just been beating the wrong horse the whole time. Maybe it's high time to chuck the proverbial horse corpse of hard drive anti-forensics into the glue factory and embrace the perpetual technological fad of mobilization. If you don't know where this one's going, I'm talking about flash memory. In this case, a small target means an efficient target. When you're dealing with data being stored in orders of magnitude smaller physical volume and not under heavy metallic shielding, the prospect of simply incinerating the entire device without tremendous collateral damage becomes not only possible, but feasible. And uh, again, I'm going to turn to XKCD to illustrate uh, one of my favorite points about flash memory again. It's just so freaking compact. And, you know, you could... Uh, you know, you could FedEx a shoebox of these flash drives, and it'd be more efficient than uh, sending stuff over the internet in a lot of cases. Uh, their hard drives are, after all, very tough beasts by comparison, especially that darn cobalt, which has a Curie point of 1115 degrees Celsius. If you fail to bring the entire surface of the platter up to that temperature, 
or hopelessly mutilate it, you risk an adversary being able to leverage scanning electron microscopy to pilfer your improperly destroyed data. Flash drives, by comparison, are a lot more on the fragile side, especially when it comes to thermal destruction. In fact, the internal control electronics of target hard drives frequently suffered catastrophic collateral damage and otherwise futile attempts to destroy their platters, so it's only logical to pick a much softer and more compact target. Hopefully we have a good idea of why this talk is titled, This Message Will Self-Destruct in 10 Seconds. Now we get a little weirder. Don't Google image and nucleation. <laughs> uh, since I'm following up a presentation titled, and that's how I lost an eye, along with, and that's how I lost my other eye, I decided to dip into op, uh, bona fide ophthalmological vernacular, also known as eye doctor speak in plain English. Uh, nucleation refers to the actual removal of an ocular orbit, a.k.a. an eye for all you laymen. <laughs> Bilateral, of course, means on both sides, so bilateral nucleation, losing both eyes. Say, falling up to lost an eye, lost another eye, get it? Yeah. Anyways, uh, we have a bona fide journal these days, so I figured I might as well take a page out of academia and, uh, you know, make this a little overly technical. This is one of my uh, personal favorite paper titles of the last year. <laughs> I won't even, you know, I'll try and read that uh, just, just for the hell of it. It's in uh, volume 25, issue 21 of Current Biology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, warts, phosphorylates, mud, dipermode, pins, mediated mitotic, spindle orientation in drosophilia, independent of Yorkie. Now, this isn't about the finer points of spindle orientation in drosophilia melanogaster, but suffice to say, if such a title can fly in a publication by cell, some liberty with ophthalmological vernacular at a computer security conference is deplorably warranted for consideration. With that absolutely horrible word salad out of the way and the motivations for this talk well behind us, we can delve into the technical meat of making data go away. Uh, so, while the bar for success for hard drive destruction uh, is high due to the extreme tenacity of cobalt, the comparable information for flash memory is far more cryptic. There just aren't publications out there on retrieving data from mutilated memory chips. We know about literally freezing DRAM to retain its data after power loss, turning volatile memory into non-volatile. We know about scanning electron microscopy for recovering individual bits of a fragment of hard drive platter. However, there's really no telling what can be done to NAND memory beyond sticking an intact chip in a logic analyzer. One of the more practical white papers I've seen on this was by Matt O at Black Hat 14, entitled Reverse Engineering Flash Memory for Fun and Benefit although it's still only covered using a logic analyzer to remove data from desoldered chips. Master's thesis by James E. Regan at the Naval Postgraduate School entitled The Forensic Potential of Flash Memory also merits uh, mention here in terms of simulating how likely remnants is for particular data on the software side, taking into account typical drive usage. Okay. So now, <laughs> how much paranoia is warranted? <laughs> Uh, I'll bet you dollars to donuts some spook agency out there has made at least some progress extracting high-value intelligence from the odd thumb drive hit by a 5.56 millimeter round in combat over the last decade. Call it hacker's intuition, an odd hunch, extreme paranoia, whatever. The point here is if you can't read it with a logic analyzer, you've got Schrodinger's data on your hands. There's no way to say for certain whether it's recoverable or not. So this essentially means if you want your data irreparably destroyed beyond hope of salvage, you need to physically obliterate the individual floating gate transistors it is stored in. Closer to the end of my talk, I'll cover the physics of doing this electrically along with the extreme challenges posed verifying such operations have completed properly. However, first I will cover the methodological underpinning as comparative strengths and system design strategy of a more direct means of getting rid of flash memory. For any Electric 6 fans out there, fire in the disco! <laughs> That's pretty much the strategy here. Uh, that's why I'm wearing this suit today, is to uh, symbolize awesome exothermic reactions. <laughs> uh, batting leadoff, we have exothermic reactions. Uh, that's a scary euphemism if you've ever heard one. Uh, while this term technically covers everything from pizza getting metabolized to nails rusting, in this particular context, it is applied more specifically to very rapid oxidation reduction reactions, producing emission spectra well into the ultraviolet. 
Now, at first blush, you might think high explosives are a logical choice for this application. However, even scaled down to teeny quantities for flash drives, they have numerous drawbacks. Let's uh, get to that. So, orange books. Uh, there are pretty much too many orange books out there to count at this point. There's the FDA orange book, approved drugs and products with therapeutic equivalency evaluations. The one you're all probably most familiar with is trusted computer systems evaluation. There's uh, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons orange book for emergency medical technicians. However, the one we're concerned with today is ATFP 5400.7 Federal Explosives Law and Regulations. This is essentially a list of energetic compounds you shouldn't synthesize without licensure within the United States jurisdiction to avoid the possibility of having your sigmoid colon resized during an all-expense-paid vacation at a correctional facility. Of course, you can take Zaz's route and get licensure or simply find another jurisdiction. <laughs> However, a morbid example from history, uh, hot gases like to throw stuff around. We deal with fragmentation. If we take this hypothetical scenario out into international waters, there are still technical reasons to steer clear from high explosives. Even assuming the issue of being able to safely store, transport, and use said material is taken care of, the issue of fragmentation is essentially insurmountable. In this case, I'm not referring to fragmentation in the commonly used medical context of secondary blast trauma, but in the context of material slated for destruction tending to be ejected in irregular and sometimes sizable pieces rather than being vaporized in a homogeneous manner. Textbook example is this picture. Uh, it is one of the key pieces of evidence from the Oklahoma City bombing case uh, where Timothy McVeigh was uh, captured antecedent to his terminally hyperkalemic encounter with old squirty at Federal Correctional Complex Terre Haute. Unfortunately for his subsequent electrolyte balance, the drive shaft of that rental truck he'd packed with ANFO was ejected several hundred feet from the scene of the blast before bouncing off this unfortunate red Honda still bearing a vehicle identification number that helped seal his fate. And this particular morbid anecdote perfectly illustrates the fact that forensically useful information can still be gleaned from ejecta originating at ground zero of misadventure with high explosives. The issue is such reactions form a tremendous amount of gas that's ejected at supersonic velocity compared to a relatively meager amount of thermal energy resulting in fracturing and dispersal of the target rather than vaporization. High explosives do teach us one important lesson in this context, though, and that's the concept of oxygen balance. Now, in this context, it's uh, referring to a monomolecular uh, reactant, but it holds with uh, multiple mixtures, too. Anyways, reactions proceeding faster than the fuel burning with only atmospheric oxygen require their, only, their own supply of an oxidizer, and the reaction energy is maximized for a given amount of reactants when the fuel to oxidizer ratio is stoichiometric and there isn't a limiting reactant. Uh, well, how are we going to take non-volatile memory and turn it quite literally into volatile memory? Everything becomes volatile if you heat it up enough. <clears throat> so the other flash, the powdered type, uh, separated fuel and oxidizers, uh, I'll get into that a little bit. This is where we edge out of impractical and potentially felonious monomolecular territory into a more practical spectrum of flash powders, thermates, and thermites. Uh, all of these mixtures have the commonality of a metallic fuel, typically either aluminum or magnesium, uh, where flash powders tend to use less stable oxidizers like chlorates and perchlorates that are capable of producing a loud, audible report, uh, sometimes a detonation even. Thermites uh, traditionally use extremely stable oxidizers, such as the prototypical ferric oxide. Thermates are, in a way, a hybrid of flash powders and thermite, using a traditional thermite reaction with the zest of a nitrate anion to deliver higher reaction rates. <laughs> now those nitrates are zesty, I tell you. Now the big downside to thermite is it's extremely difficult to set off. Uh, you can literally dump gasoline on a pile of thermite, set the gas on fire, and all the gas will burn off without igniting the thermite. Really the only reliable ways to initiate thermite are an intense electric arc and burning magnesium metal. Uh, so let's move on. This is a great chart uh, by a guy named Richard Naka. He's kind of a famous rocketry geek. And uh, he put together a chart of a lot of different thermite compositions because aluminum and rust are uh, actually not the only two reactants you can use here. There are a tremendous number of uh, potential fuels and oxidizers 
more so than the oxidizers. The fuels, again, stay pretty much uh, magnesium and aluminum. Uh, so we've got an entire spectrum of reaction rates from a rather vigorous cupric oxide thermite, which produces an audible report and a quick flash. Uh, Zaz demonstrated that he's got some great video to the rather anemic titanium dioxide thermite, which barely fizzles. Wouldn't even recommend checking that out. <laughs> Fun fact, though, uh, titanium dioxide is the same stuff in sunscreen and yogurt pretzels. <laughs> but really, a uh, thermite reaction is just about swapping around oxygen between two different types of metals, releasing a large amount of heat in the process. Uh, this chart of relative thermite potency pretty well covers that. Okay, so let's move on to uh, thermates. Yes, you say thermite, I say thermate. Uh, net positive oxygen balance helps to consume the target, provided the target is combustible. Uh, so these usually have a higher... Yeah, sorry, stuffy throat here. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so if thermates have a uh, much higher reaction rate usually than thermites, uh, perhaps not surprisingly it's advantageous to have that net positive oxygen balance when you're attempting to rapidly burn up the combustible substance, uh, such as the plastic housing of an integrated circuit. This is where nitrates come in. Uh, not only do nitrates produce large amounts of oxygen upon thermal decomposition to aid in the combustion of a flammable target, but they also decompose at significantly lower temperatures than oxidizers in pure thermite reactions leading to additional sensitization and higher reaction rates. Of course, many other factors come into play in thermite and thermate reactions. Uh, particle size is a huge one. Uh, of course, particle size and surface area for a given weight of reactant are inversely correlated, and greater surface area along with greater mixing of reactants contributes to a higher reaction rate. So you can't just uh, slather stoichiometric proportions of drywall plaster onto aluminum beams, dry it out in the oven, and call it thermite. You need powdered reactants, in fact about 100 mesh, uh, meaning each particle being less than 1 one hundredth of an inch pretty much is the largest you can realistically get by with making thermite reactants. The larger and less homogeneous the reaction particles, the slower and more unpredictable the reaction tends to progress. Going to the opposite end of the spectrum, we have nanothermite, which honestly I don't want to get into too much since it's become so synonymous with the conspiracy theories regarding 9-11, but suffice to say it's pretty potent stuff and a bit difficult to manufacture. However, we can do pretty well with micron-sized particles, and they're much easier to manufacture by traditional ball milling. So in terms of uh, specific thermate compositions, uh, there are really infinitely many of them. The prototypical thermate was developed by the U.S. military uh, called Thermate TH3, which consists of 51.525% ferric oxide, 21%, or, sorry, 29% barium nitrate, uh, and 17.175% aluminum with 2% sulfur as a sensitizer and 0.3% polybutadiene and acryl nitrile as a binder. Uh, so you know, why not just use this stuff? Well, it turns out barium functions as a potassium channel blocker in living organisms, leading to convulsions and death with significant exposure. It's pretty toxic stuff. And also this is Schmucon, so proving technology is boring when you can roll your own. <laughs> Uh, so let's move on to the next slide. If I can, okay, here we go. DIYing less toxic thermates. Uh, oh my goodness, one of the things I completely forgot to mention before. Calcium sulfate, when you replace the uh, iron oxide, the rust, in regular thermite with the drywall, calcium sulfate, uh, it becomes significantly uh, hotter. It burns at a uh, much higher temperature I'll not quite necessarily as vigorously, uh, but it is a, uh, a much uh, better fuel than ferric oxide. The issue is that it uh, is just even harder to initiate. Even a magnesium ribbon is not always uh, efficacious in, uh, in initiating it. Anyways, so uh, I've developed my own thermate composition that has some of its own relative merits and complications compared to traditional thermate. Uh, my mixture consists by weight of 50% calcium sulfate. 20% uh, calcium nitrate, 16% ferric oxide, 12% aluminum, and 2% sulfur. All reactants being smaller than 500 mesh and anhydrous. So how exactly did I come up with this? Well, trial and error combined with what you can still get at garden supply stores. <laughs> uh, calcium sulfate thermite by itself, despite being the hottest burning, is far too impractical to reliably initiate, even with magnesium ribbon. 
adding in about one part regular ferric oxide thermite for each three parts of calcium sulfate thermite successfully sensitizes it to about as frustrating to initiate as plain old ferric oxide thermite. Calcium nitrate, as long as it is anhydrous and stored in an airtight container, makes a fine substitute for barium nitrate with similar oxygen-releasing properties and far less toxicity. I mean, you've probably all taken a gram or two of calcium a day. Do it not with barium, it'd kill you. Of course, uh, <laughs> uh, do, 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 where are we at here? Yeah, so it can be... Uh, uh, the substitute for, for barium nitrate. Uh, anyways, uh, sulfur, of course, acts as a sensitizer to further uh, lower the ignition uh, point of mixture so that it can be set off with a simple sparkler, consumer firework. Uh, so I've got a video demonstration that I can try and bring up here. Uh, actually, looks like I have the same video twice here, so we're going to get to see something else I'll talk about in a second. Uh, this is the thermate that I uh, made, though. Let's take a look. The laptop doesn't freeze up on me. So here we're uh, just looking at the sparkler going, and it's about to hit the thermate. You can hear it's dimming a little, and... Uh, about to go. And there we go. That uh, quick little burst, we get some ultraviolet emission in there, wipes out the camera, and uh, yeah, there we go. I, I actually set off a, a reaction. <laughs> yeah, so we're just smoking at this point. Uh, now, believe it or not, that was only about seven grams of this stuff. I mean, this stuff's really freaking potent. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's five readily available uh, non-toxic chemicals that are capable of being initiated by a consumer pyrotechnic device into a ferocious fireball a significant fraction of the temperature of the surface of the sun. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it or even necessarily the best way to do it, but this is certainly a damn easy type of thermate to produce that displays pretty high efficacy. Of course, the next question would be how much do you need to get rid of flash memory? Uh, let's change up the slides again here. This is all hacked together. <laughs> Come on, we can change. There we go. <laughs> Math and my chemistry. <laughs> all those fancy equations solving for surface black body radiation, enthalpy of vaporization, and all the rest of that crap are honestly pretty vacuous here. If you want to model, refine, and validate some production system based off this technology, or you happen to uh, find this a fun time to spend your Saturday nights, uh, maybe you can do that. However, in terms of practical means to an end, I can assure you just a few grams of this thermate mixture is more than enough to cremate an integrated circuit beyond any recognition with a few factors of safety. It's not even a contest. It's like an MMA fight between Holly Holm and Stephen Hawking. There's only one logical outcome. Maybe I'll be arsed to actually run these calculations in time for my entry in the new Journal of Schmoo, or whatever we're calling it now. Uh, but you can consider the thermodynamics to be a case study in gitter gun, seat of the pants engineering. However, containing it is a different matter entirely. Just about anything that is unlucky enough to get into contact with burning thermate is going to end up with about as much function as Stephen Hawking's biceps. To illustrate this point, I decided to make an impromptu extreme barbecue with a rotten steak ultimately destined for the compost heap. And that was indeed the, uh, the video you saw, uh, which was, you know, about seven grams of the thermate. And now we can uh, see what, you know, the steak happened, what happened to the steak over there. It's completely carbonized. <laughs> I mean, that is, uh, that's really done for. Uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty spectacular. The steak is beyond well done. Any nasty bacteria and fungi that previously colonized that particular specimen of bovine myogenesis during its protracted stay in my refrigerator have definitely gone to that big agar-coated petri dish in the sky. You wouldn't want any body parts to trade places with it, especially when you look at the aftermath. Complete carbonization. Uh, that would equate to third or fourth degree burns on a human patient, and in the best case scenario, some full thickness skin grafts, perhaps coupled with a latissimus dorsi free flap transplant. So how do we contain such a fierce chemical reaction? Uh, that is the next slide. A portable flash crematory. <laughs> And what we're looking at is, uh, is an overhead cutaway of that on the left, and uh, 
some Kevlar wrapped around a pipe as a form on the right there. Uh, so how exactly did I get to this little bit of craziness? And it's essentially a type of crucible. Uh, it's where the high-performance composites from construction trades come in. Although Kevlar is most widely known for its bullet-stopping capabilities when sewn into many layers, its mechanical toughness stretches into a wide variety of applications, and its heat resistance combined with inability to combust make it the perfect choice of fabric for the suit I am currently wearing. It's just, you know, aluminized. Uh, however, it is not capable of withstanding direct exposure to thermate. So, you know, I have to be at a standoff distance when I'm doing these reactions. Go in there with lighter, nick, and uh, get back. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, it is nearly impervious to uh, less extreme heat. Uh, however, again, it can't, uh, can't hold up to thermates. Uh, there are some major downsides, though, which is mostly the uh, propensity for Kevlar to decompose uh, into gaseous products when it does get hot enough, so you essentially want to keep it below about uh, 7 or 800 degrees Fahrenheit, usually. However, it's still quite tough, even at the uh, limits of its thermal properties. Anyways, the materials that are capable of withstanding direct exposure to thermate are uh, mostly ceramics. Uh, they do have some major downsides themselves, too. Uh, one is their huge propensity to fracture when exposed to extremely quick changes in temperature. You know, if you've ever heated up a piece of glass or sprayed water on a light bulb and it just uh, completely shatters on you, that's a pretty good example of it. Uh, so, one of the interesting things is you can pick up refractory cement designed for patching fireplaces at most home improvement stores. It'll do a reasonable job of stopping brief contact with thermate. Uh, however, designing a crucible you can see the need for reinforcement to prevent thermal fracture. This is where the Kevlar comes in. Reinforce uh, essentially this refractory cement with Kevlar, and uh, it becomes much more uh, tenacious, shall we say, like uh, tenacity. <laughs> uh, my design for a simple portable uh, flash drive crucible negative mold uh, essentially resembles some sort of crazy bunt cake with the center slightly wider than the flash drive. About a quarter inch of refractory cement lining the inside, followed by our five layers of Kevlar there, and then at least about another quarter inch of, uh, okay, whatever. Anyways, then at least another quarter inch of uh, refractory cement on the outside. Uh, then we've got, uh, sorry, I got a little distracted there. The uh, center well in which the flash drive is inserted should be at least about four inches deep to help contain the slag. We'll call this the devil's bunt cake. <laughs> uh, so let's take a look. When the crucible is uh, ultimately cast with the refractory cement, we get something that looks a bit like this. There we go. Uh, believe it or not, you can actually find huge bolts of Kevlar on eBay. Uh, the annoying thing about working with Kevlar, though, is it's pretty close to impossible to cut for any avid Neil Stevenson fans out there who might even recognize my pseudonym from one of his books. You may remember the brief depiction of Ceramic Knives' ability to shear Kevlar in his novel Snow Crash. Well, it turns out this is pretty true to life. Even your crappy run-of-the-mill $8 ceramic knife from the Woodbridge Harbor Freight Tools goes through Kevlar like a hot knife through butter. Uh, here we can see sheets of Kevlar wrapped around the inner form, in this case with a wooden broom handle. Uh, actually, that's not what ended up getting put up there. A little embarrassing, huh? Was the PVC pipe form before. Anyways, just moving on a little bit. <laughs> See, this is what happens when I don't update my notes in time and I'm catching a taxi to get here at the last minute. Yeah, uh, yeah. so I can uh, show you. We have a flash drive loaded inside of this particular crucible here. Uh, you can see that poor little flash drive getting ready to get uh, cremated. And uh, essentially, the loading process is rather simple. We just dump the uh, thermate on top of the flash drive, the uh, prospective victim here, stick a little sparkler in the top, uh, and then I have another video uh, where I can show you this in action. Actually, a little practicality for once. Uh, let's take a look at that. Here we go. It's like a birthday cake. So our sparkler's going. And give it a second here. Just has to burn down. 
and now we're about to go. Good little flash there. Although if you'll notice, there's really not much slag getting ejected by comparison. It's just a lot of uh, hot gases ionized to the point of glowing. <laughs> uh, now we're just smoking again. Uh, so, yeah, there we go. <laughs> wait, wait until you see what uh, what happened. Uh, so, now we're back to the presentation and uh, barbecued flash. Anyone? I mean, there's literally nothing remotely resembling a flash drive there. <laughs> Again, this was only a few grams of this thermate, and uh, there's just a little bit of slag down there. You can see the burnt out sparkler survived better than the flash drive. <laughs> uh, so that's uh, that's pretty spectacular. Uh, there's really not much left to uh, tell you about flash drive at this point. <laughs> I mean, the device can randomly eject slag on occasion, but uh, some nasty flash drive smoke, which you probably shouldn't breathe, does get ejected too. All in all, it's not too impractical if you really need the option of having that data gone at the drop of a hat. You know, I've got to say I kind of set my own challenge here, but I think I met it pretty well and, you know, didn't get bilaterally nucleated. Anyways, wow, we're getting short on time here, so I'll just sort of really breeze through this next section, which was supposed to be a little longer. <laughs> but anyways, the, the second thing that I looked at was uh, the other, other flash, and that's uh, arc flash. Uh, protective suits for that are pretty similar to this type of uh, protective suit also. <laughs> and uh, arc flash is essentially a, uh, a large amount of uh, molten vapor, a molten metal that turns into a vapor due to electrical heating from a uh, very high voltage. Uh, now, this usually refers to a, uh, a high tension line, like a power transmission line. However, a monophasic pulse from a capacitor bank can be quite effective in destroying flash memory. This was something that Zaz again touched on a little bit in his talk. Uh, and I was hoping to get into it a little more, but uh, essentially, flash memory operates by storing a capacitive charge in what's known as a floating gate transistor. Uh, the floating gate transistor is uh, its pretty similar to a field effect transistor, except it has two layers of metal oxide in series, allowing for a charge to be stored capacitively, and thus flash memory can remember which state it's in. Uh, so TLDR, you sort of just take a bigger capacitor and throw it on there, and uh, you can uh, cause what's called Fowler-Nordheim tunneling. Uh, and that's what's used usually to erase a uh, flash drive, but if you then continue to jack the power up even higher, you know, just keep pouring more and more capacitive energy in there, uh, you can cause the oxide to rupture, and that irreparably destroys an individual NAND gate. Uh, again, we have, uh, let's get on to the next slide here, kind of an issue that we don't really know a, uh, yeah, there's the Fallon order, I'm tumbling, we'll just skip over that, we don't really have a good benchmark as to uh, what exactly kills NAND memory, uh, and I didn't have the time to go, or time or resources to go do scanning electron microscopy on a, uh, a flash drive that had been killed with a capacitor bank, so I can say, you know, blow a little chunk out of it, uh, probably take care of most of the logic, maybe a boost converter on there, but in terms of the uh, individual NAND gates storing your data, it's really hard to say what's, uh, you know, what is and isn't anti-forensically sound. Uh, so, Essentially, if you ever wanted to turn this into a, you know, a field device, something that's a turnkey solution, you'd have to look at a, kind of a whole systematic decomposition of how a uh, data destruction gets triggered. I mean, should this be a fail-safe device, fail-dangerous device? Do we have like an operator presence device to see if uh, maybe your secret courier has dropped their flash drive and then it should burn up? Or, uh, you know, how do we... Uh, how do we deal with that? Anyway, we're almost out of time here, so uh, anyone who was uh, hoping to get a uh, mission-critical stovepipe, unfortunately we're a little bit uh, short on those today. But I do have some other interesting ideas for future research. Uh, thermic lances, it's essentially a huge, uh, a huge piece of iron that you pump high-pressure oxygen through, and uh, it burns pretty similar to thermite uh, at a very high temperature and it ejects a lot of slag in a uh, single direction, almost similar to those explosively formed penetrators that Zaz was screwing around with, uh, except, you know, it's not an actual explosive. So I think that's an interesting thing to look at. Uh, flywheel energy storage, another interesting concept uh, that I think would be good to explore, especially with hard drives. Uh, potentially have a flywheel that can spin the hard drive platter up fast enough to uh, physically destroy it through uh, centrifugal force. And even electron guns, you know, why the hell not put some beta radiation in there and see what happens. Uh, anyways, I think we're about done on time now, uh, so I'll turn it over to the uh, EFF so that they can, uh, you know, 
let you know about the latest uh, legislative creepings by our misguided government toward the Orwellian tyranny of a global panopticon powered by signals intelligence. All right, three alarm lamp scooter out.